Hello, good morning. Welcome back to another episode of the Waffle Press Movie Hangouts. I'm your host, Diego Crespo. With me today is my co-host, Gina Versa. Hey, how's it going? Well, I just spilled coffee on my <laughs> 11-year-old laptop, so RIP to the laptop. If you if you see me carry it around, it's the one with my name on it, and the little little stencil, like in the in the newsrooms when you're you have to have your binders. It doesn't matter. It's it's dying now. But uh, thank you, laptop, for all the the years you you stood with me. But RIP. other than that, I'm doing pretty good, Gene. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good in uh, still in Park City, Utah. Here, uh, <laughs> don't don't touch your collar when you. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that picked it up a lot. Yeah. All right. Here, go ahead. Do it again. I'm just in uh, Park City, Utah, still. Yeah, it looks cold. Looks yeah. very cold there. Just wearing the shirt. Not very helpful. Yeah, I know. Watch out for for hypothermia. But who else <laughs> is there with Eugene to uh-huh. talk about Sundance movies with us today? Well, they should all be inside, but he is our good friend Andrew. <laughs> Hello, people. Um, very happy to be back. Sundance is always one of my favorite um, times of the year. And these these last uh, seven days or so have really screwed me over. I've been running on like two, three hours of sleep every day. Uh, writing nonstop, doing all this stuff nonstop. So it's fun to finally get to like, you know, after like a, a, a 15 hour sleep, it's like, you know, relax and be able to like to look back, up, look back on it and see like what, what worked and what maybe didn't work. Yeah, that's good, man. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, was it the first time you were on, Andrew, that we had you on to see what you you had seen at Sundance, right? That was like two I, years ago. I don't ago think now? it was the first. Yeah, that that was last year. No, no, no it was two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah, uh, I don't think that was the first time I was on, but that was the year that uh, what's the name of that God? Uh, what's the name of that freaking movie with the Jake Gyllenhaal? Oh, oh, yeah, no, no, yeah. No, 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 yeah. The year of that disappointment. Oh, and that yeah. seems like just that seems like just a memory. Like that isn't that seems so long ago right now. Yeah, it really did. It feels like another world. <laughs> like a different. That was like a different landscape. Uh, now that we're like post like quarantine, I guess. Well, unfortunately, post quarantine, it's like they want us to be post quarantine, but no one's doing anything to help us about it. No. So hey, Joe Biden, give us our money. Eric Garcetti, <laughs> Gavin Newsom, go fuck yourselves. Do I want. I want two K. Not. 1400 what is that yeah i know yeah. they're on tape for promising things whatever you know how, if you follow us on twitter you know how, you feel about know how this. it is <laughs> yeah you know how it is but today we're here to talk about some sundance stuff but before we get into that any quick recommendations you want to do for the people at home that didn't go to sundance because we don't want to just be those pretentious film nerds that are like you got to watch this and it's not like publicly available for anybody so yeah what is available to people to watch at home yeah like on uh, redbox i just rented batman Soul of the Dragon, which is just basically Batman in the Enter the Dragon movie, and yeah. um, it's like a it's a Batman movie, but it's not. It's like a secret film on like all the DC martial artists characters, so like Richard Dragon, Lady Shiva, uh, Bronze Tiger, and it's very inspired by like the Denny O'Neill run. So it has like all the '70s Batman characters. And uh, yeah, I, I was I was really enjoying it because it's like a, a really good martial arts movie and just kind of like a spy movie, too. So like, um, you know, that aspect of Batman, I don't really can't really think in any of the films that they really focused on his uh, martial arts training. I guess Batman begins to an extent, but it's more like him being a ninja. I mean, that's still, that's martial arts training. Yeah, but like exclusively for that, I guess. Yeah, that's that's how it begins. <laughs> but the movie, the movie you just pitched sounds sounds exciting. Like when you said Enter the Dragon, but with Batman, that sounds like exciting. Yeah, Michael Jai White is Bronze Tiger. Yeah, in he that comes again, back. Right? Yeah, he comes yeah. back as a uh, Bronze Tiger, and um, you know he's uh, you know he voices a character, and um, you know he um, he was great in Arrow as Bronze Tiger, but um, his Bronze Tiger is like a little different in uh, this iteration, the way he's written. He's like an angry guy, so he's more like Black Dynamite, I guess. <laughs> like that kind of uh, personality. Because um, I think in the DC Comics, Bronze Tiger is a little bit better than Batman as a martial artist. Like he could probably, he could probably beat Batman most times, but you know, um, 
that character needs more um more recognition because I was uh, kind of annoyed he wasn't in the Suicide Squad. Yeah. Uh, oh, cool. that's, that's too bad. Um, I thought Idris Elba was going to be playing him, but he's not. Right. And that's what, whatever. I trust James Gunn, you know, uh, yeah. but shout out to Arrow because when that show hit, you mm-hmm. know, cause it, it ended last year, there's an arc where him, Green Arrow and, um, and, uh, Bronze Tiger team up in a prison riot mm-hmm. and Michael Jai White punches a man so hard. He ends up exploding in an electrical box and it's, it's fucking unbelievable. It's, it's so awesome. Yeah. The entire season should have been just them teaming up to fight crime because that was yeah. the shit yeah i yeah i really enjoy michael j white like whenever he's in something he always like i don't know like gives it more like if he's in the dark knight as like a random gangster character who really does uh contribute a lot more than like people give him credit for um he was uh yeah he was even in like a movie i worked on it was called the crooked man like in a few scenes and yeah i was uh always have a personal uh favoritism Michael J. White and he spawned as well. You know, one black dynamite too. We'll eventually get that. Eventually. Hopefully. Eventually. Yeah. But uh, Andrew, anything else you saw? Because I know you specifically were very busy with Sundance covering it. Yes, I was. Uh, I was covering the whole festival for a uh, discussing film. Like I we do it every year. Um incredible like I can't, I can't overstate it. i've been running on like two or three hours of sleep every day I'm but so sorry. <laughs> yeah, i mean i did it to myself i can't complain but in terms of a movie that is available or that will be available to people like uh, this week correct yeah yeah like if, if we were to watch a movie right now on our, on our televisions or whatever like what would you recommend to someone to watch tonight because he's very he's a very cool guy and he's, and he's been kind to and i talked to him last year he's not only been kind to like discussing film, but he's very chill. Uh, Matt Tim Tomlin, he co-wrote the Batman with Matt Reeves, and he uh, also wrote uh, Project Power, that Netflix movie that came out last year. But this week, he has another film coming out, and like this is gonna this is gonna be a big turnoff for like a lot of people. But it's about a pandemic. Mm-hmm. But he wrote this like before COVID. Yeah. So it was like kind of one of those things where, and it's happened more more often than you think. That especially at, at Sundance, there's a lot of pandemic movies this year, but a lot of them were actually like, quote unquote, that's what they say. They were in the works before you know everything went 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 to shit. Yeah, but Matt Tomlin has a new movie. It's called Little Fish. It comes out this Friday, and it stars Olivia Cook. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's like a little quirky. Like, uh, it's the premise is that like the pandemic or like like the quote unquote what's going on is that there's like a there's like a sickness that is making people forget like their memories. Mm-hmm. So he plays kind of like a twist on that. And I've heard nothing but great things about it. So if there's something that you want to check out. Also, like a lot of people love Olivia Cook. What's, what's, what's wrong with that? Yeah. And Matt's, Matt's, he's a, he's a talented guy. Like he has a lot of, a lot of his ideas really work all the time. I'm excited for what, he, what he's bringing to the table for the Batman. So if that's also something that you're looking forward to, which is probably like everybody, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, check out, you know, it's always fun to check out, uh, some of the other works that these people do because you know they just don't do you know cape movies you know what i mean so yeah. it'll give you like an idea of like this person's sensibilities um his range as like a storyteller so i would definitely recommend that this week it comes out this friday oh okay so netflix has two upcoming big hits then because it's that and malcolm and marie right right oh, no, it's not a netflix movie i don't i don't believe oh. it it's it's like one of those oh, like oh okay well, well, sorry i just yeah. had that in my brain uh, like, uh, but malcolm <laughs> malcolm and marie i'm sorry it is also coming out this week okay. uh having seen that movie i i absolutely i don't know if i can recommend it um it is good but it's not a movie where you can just like in this like, hey, let me just pop this on right now you know what i mean let me just let yeah. me just watch two hours of these uh, uh a couple who just uh belittle each other in the most like toxic and uh, triggering ways uh, that's not an easy movie to watch in my opinion it's not uh, <laughs> and the, the discourse around it is going to be incredibly uh like i don't know what else a better better word to say it's going to be annoying yeah. <laughs> it already is kind of like annoying that people are kind of like getting the whole point of it but even so like the movie it doesn't shy away from what it's trying to do for better for worse and i think a lot of people are going to have a lot of, of things to say about it and it, like I, i'm just leaving it at that but the movies the movies is good but 
if you want to put something maybe a little bit more lighter than that, you don't want to see two people just like be the most toxic people you can ever imagine, then I would probably watch Little Fish. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I think Malcolm Marie, the, the black and white photography looks really good. And John David Washington and Zendaya are both fantastic actors. And I wish nothing Absolutely. was the best from them. Yeah, no, uh, definitely. They are innocent. They are innocent. The, Yes, and in, indeed, yeah. indeed. Uh, I guess my little one recommendation before we hop into Sundance Ten. This is the only reason I even put this section in the episode outline today is because I really loved Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts on Netflix. Uh, it's an animated series about a girl from a burrow in a post-apocalyptic wasteland who gets shot out into the world where humans are no longer on top of the food chain. Uh, animals can talk mostly. There's giant rabbits the size of skyscrapers. Um, there's a monkey warlord and by the final season they're talking about why eugenics is evil and it's so good and if you want to be happy for little 25 minute chunks at a time during your day uh, I would not recommend anything else it is it was so good it might be like the best thing Netflix has ever oh. produced and distributed like hands down like it I was oh. I was in awe but uh, yeah that's that's the shit right there. Uh, and I guess now we can just hop into Sundance stuff. Yeah. So, Andrew, this is your third Sundance? Yes. First virtual, of course. But I, mean, it is like yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the only reason Gene and I could go this year. Yeah. 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 Like, try to, to go in as critics. Uh, and then now it was available to everyone, which I thought was great. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there's still, you know, the, the price thing is, is what, but whatever, right? Like, that's a bigger discussion overall, not yeah. just yeah. a Sundance thing. Um, but I had I, a great... Yeah. No, I was gonna say, I, I, if I could interject really quick, yeah, yeah. Um, having seen the way that previous festivals in the age of COVID have tried to make themselves as as accessible as possible under under COVID, I will say that this, even though it wasn't perfect per se, but this Sundance Fest was by far the most successful in terms of uh, spreading that that's accessibility to people at home who usually can't even make the festival at home. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you usually can't even make it to Utah, and I think they deserve great credit for that because mm -hmm. it ran smoothly. Even though there were like a few things, like we talked about, like the money and et cetera, it ran smoothly. And from what I saw over the week, there was I've never seen that many people on my feed actively engaged and actively talking about these mm -hmm. movies. Obviously, because you know everyone can do it now, but I think that's a good thing. So the fact that we, I can be here talking to you guys instead of and you guys actually know what i'm talking about because the last time i was here i was just describing things to gene and he was like oh yeah okay like you, you can only get so far you know yeah so i will say that that is a great benefit and moving forward i think a lot of other festivals maybe tiff this year they're gonna take examples from how they did this yeah yeah i hope so because i was um you know because i it wasn't like a festival but i was kind of like if you compare like sundance at home to like let's say like comic-con at home Oh, no, my God. Yeah, this was you better. Know, like, yeah. it's leagues different because, like, I don't know, kind of like, um, you know, because you guys all saw the panels at Comic-Con at home, and it was just, like, just a bunch of, like, YouTube videos. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, it was, like, a YouTube channel, and, like, the interactivity that they did in, like, uh, Sundance, like, making everything virtual wasn't just, all right, we're going to make everything, like, you could watch at home. It was also, like, interacting, like, you could do chat. You could ask, um, like, a question during the video um they had like a like a microsoft little like virtual mm -hmm. reality event um i don't know it kind of reminded me i don't know if you guys will uh, get annoyed at the comparison but it reminded me of like ready player one it's like <laughs> i'm not you know? i'm not annoyed by that comparison at all and yeah. i think you know my issues with that material and that film more right. so the material like it, that idea is like probably where a lot of like online stuff is headed in the future like that's right. not like a crazy thought you know it's really yeah. just that Ernest Klein's a hack. But anyways, no, no, no like, for, for, for real, like, I, I, yeah. I, I think that was great. You know, I didn't really yeah. participate in that. I, I didn't really have enough time, unfortunately. Right, right. But I, I think that, that, was, that was terrific. And, yeah. you know, to the Comic-Con point, it's also kind of revealed that, like, oh, yeah, Comic-Con's not really anything. It's kind of just a, a marketing machine. Right. That's why there's not really a lot to do. Not, not that Sundance is perfect either, right. but, like, <laughs> You know, it's it was cool to like to have all these other opportunities to engage with 
people either on social mm-hmm. media or like you're, you guys are bringing up in, in the rooms and stuff like that. Yeah. And the waiting rooms are always kind of fun because yeah. you always saw people like drop in their Twitter handles or their Instagrams or their yep. letterbox. So I saw so many people sharing their letterbox. Like letterbox <laughs> was like, let uh, the letterbox traffic, they should thank Sundance because they their traffic or however they measure that probably spiked this last mm-hmm. week. Oh yeah, I would so imagine. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. Like all the interactivity and then all the people going on to letterbox after the log shit. Yeah. Pretty uh pretty high, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um really quick timeout. Is anyone scratching something? It sounded like a. Wait, you hear this? Yeah. Is that? Do you hear that? Yeah, yeah, I heard that a little bit. Yeah. Okay, that's something that it's like on my desk. Oh, okay. okay I must uh, stop. I was... Yeah, yeah. Please, just just. Okay, uh, okay, sorry. Right. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's like, just all good. You it's all good. Hear that? Really? Yeah. My God. If anything, that's just testament to your, your you know, your computer. Yeah. But, all right, all right. Well, I'll cut. I'll cut out of that. Um. So why don't we start from. Andrew first because you're kind of the Sundance head honcho here. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, you know what? Let me backtrack really quick. I okay. want to shout out some other uh, film critics that I thought wrote really great stuff about Sundance or specific movies in particular. And obviously, check out Andrew and discussing film as a whole, not just because he's on here, but also like I genuinely also engage with your guys' stuff. Otherwise, I would just not even bring it up. Exactly. But um, uh, I want to bring up a Siddhant Adlaka, who is a great uh, Indian writer who wrote a really great article about Prisoners of Ghostland, which we're going to talk about today. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brianna Ziegler, Angie Han, um, and Winley, who is uh, all, all those are great, great film critics. Check them out. I'll put bio uh, links in the description so you can check out their Twitters because that's where they link all their stuff to. But uh, mm-hmm. Andrew, what is the best thing you saw at Sundance? What else did you see at Sundance? Help us springboard this conversation into all the movies we saw. Because I think in total, we saw a lot, <laughs> all yeah. three of us. Um, I can say that the best movie that I saw, and I'm going to be brutally honest because, you know, having gone to two other festivals uh, the year before, overall, I think this year's fest was pretty solid. But still, at the same time, I, it kind of left me wanting more. And again, it's kind of unfair to say that because, you know, the circumstances at hand. But when yeah. you look at, back at last year, um, you have like Promising a Woman, Minari, films that are leading discussion right now. But last year, you also had like incredible, in my opinion, like perfect horror films like La Llorona, His House. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen His House on Netflix, like change that immediately. It's like a perfect film, in my opinion. But this year, I wasn't getting that much of that, those feelings, you know. So I'm not saying I was underwhelmed, so more or less, but... The best film that I saw, I didn't see until the very end, which was yesterday. And I can say it's Flea. It's an animated documentary, hype, like narrative hybrid. Um, it got picked up by Neon. And uh, right before the festival started, Neon picked it up. And Rez Ahmed came aboard as an executive producer. And the film's like in three different languages. So when it gets released in the US, Rez Ahmed is going to voice uh, the lead in English. Uh, but... To, to describe it really quick, it's it's a documentary still because it's about um, this guy, this this documentary filmmaker has a friend, and this friend has been he's a refugee from Afghanistan, but a majority of his story has been kept secret for like for safety reasons, for lack like, you know there's a better way to say it. So he finally opened up his whole story to this documentary filmmaker. So this filmmaker, in order to protect his, uh, his identity and, and the identities of the people in this tale. He just animated it. Mm-hmm. He animated it and um, he made it like a whole feature and it's 2D animation. Uh, I don't know. It's not, um, I don't know what the frame rate is. It's not, uh, what do you call it? Is it like 24 frames when things go like a uh, thing? 24 frames like, is like the standard one? No, yeah. But what is it in animation when things kind of like, I move kind of like, like in blocks? Oh, yeah. It's, it's a, it's like a lower, it's a it's lower frame like rate. A lo- I guess. It's yeah. a lower or, or frame like, rate. I don't know the exact number. Yeah. It's a lower frame rate. It's 2D animated and it's freaking beautiful. Like the animation itself is freaking beautiful. Um, a lot of it is, um, it combines like archival footage, like of course what it does, but I cannot even like describe that. This movie, out of any movie in the entire festival is the only movie that made me absolutely like weak. 
when I mean weep, I was like in the matter of like it was it was already powerful, but there's something in the third act. I'm not gonna say obviously, but on like on the whiff of like just like that, I, I just started Ooh. bawling my eyes out. It's incredibly powerful. It's like when there's movies about like you know like refugee tales, and some people say it's eye opening or it's timely. You know that's kind of redundant, even though that's very much true. It's kind of redundant because like this stuff has always been going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. And only it's only eye opening if you've just never paid attention, right? But it's profoundly like prob like the best thing that I saw, and like I get like I get choked up talking about it because I don't think there's a story that has combined multiple art forms in this way and managed to make something that's completely its own. So like, yeah, you've seen documentaries before or you've seen animated films before, but you've never seen anything like this in the way that it mixes everything. And it just like, it pulls at your heart. My God. Like, I don't know. It's really hard to talk about because it's like, because it's so like, just like so profound, but that's, but hands down the best thing that I saw. And what, and I expect it to be, um, in a like an awards contender, absolutely. Like when it comes out, and like not not this not this uh, not this year, but next year it's gonna it always gonna go for uh, all all the big awards. And especially when you have like Rizal Med voicing, because it's in, like three different languages right now. So when they translate it to English, um, I think it's gonna hit hard for a lot of people. It's gonna hit home like for so many. And I don't know. There's not there's like nothing wrong about I like as again like there's nothing negative I can say about it. It's just so good. And it won awards at Sundance, and I'm surprised that I don't see as m- I see a few people talking about it, but they probably just think they don't think anything as much because it's like a documentary, you know. Like people, mm-hmm. they kind of want to pay more attention to the narrative features. Mm-hmm. But oh my god, no! This is like this is the most like cinematic documentary I've seen in a long time. Ooh. That's by far like if you're gonna see something out of this year when it comes out, you gotta see that absolutely. And I think going after that underneath like the most fun that i had and the most like unhinged experience was like absolutely prisoners of the coastland Mm -hmm. but yeah absolutely i don't think this movie's for everybody in the sense that like it's definitely like for the cage heads you know the nicholas cage Uh, oh here let's hold on yeah i'll we'll save that for when i go because i want to run down what else you saw that gene and i didn't and then gene will go okay okay. i'll go back to prisoners of the ghost line because i have a lot to say about that (laughs) Okay, so another movie that I saw that you guys probably did, and I'm trying to think really quick because you guys saw a lot. Yeah. I saw Eight for Silver, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I didn't see that. The, Gene, did you see that? Yeah, I yeah. saw it. I really All right, then here, it. how about this? Um, you guys tag team that one, then Gene, you choose one, okay. and then I'll wrap <laughs> us up with uh, Prisoners of the Ghost Line because I think you and I definitely saw one of the same ones, Gene. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, for sure. sure. Mm-hmm. yeah eight okay. for Sil- yeah eight for silver is like um yeah i was really enjoying it like it reminded me of like a del toro movie like some of his early work um it was very like gothic horror and uh yeah i haven't seen a uh, Broy- boyd holbrook in a movie for a little bit like um yeah i can't remember like the last film he was in it's probably the predator no yeah, no, the no, predator. no. My, he he was in the um some netflix film called under oh. the shadow of the moon or something like that oh, okay right? he's in he's in we can be heroes he's not a big role yeah that's right yeah but no i mean i always enjoyed him in logan and um you know the fact that i guess he's a uh werewolf hunter in this movie i don't know more or less you can say werewolves that. or whatever the fuck they're supposed to be <laughs> i think that the, the mass appeal of this film is that when you describe it and when you, when you try to sell it to someone, it kind of sounds like an A24 movie. Right. A la, it sounds like The Witch, but, mm-hmm. or Werewolves, or it sounds like, I didn't see Gretel and Hansel, but I know a lot of people enjoyed the movie, that the, the movie that came out last year. Yeah, I saw it. It was like cinematic, and it was mm-hmm. like a really gothic twist on that, that classic story. A for Silver, it sounds like that on paper. Yeah. But, and then mostly, for the, for, yeah, for the most part, when you watch it, it is kind of that. Uh, I wouldn't call it like the strongest film I saw right. from the festival this year, but it well, absolutely is one of the stronger horror movies that I saw yeah, because I saw I, a few other horror films that just did not work for me. And this one, it kind of did. Yeah, I thought it was really unique. And um, there wasn't any other film uh, like it up as the, at the festival because that was the last one I saw. Because mm-hmm. I think I had like two hours left on my uh, pass, and I'm like, oh, I could see one more movie. 
and I had eight for silver, like kind of favorited. It was like, okay, like uh, it's like he's hunting werewolves. Like, all right, why not? Yeah, yeah. And I was, and I was really surprised, and I was like dead tired too watching it, and it got me out of like a slumber. Well, like, I mean, yeah, that movie wakes you up, like for for better or for worse, because there's it's just full of um shocking imagery, so you can't yeah. really sleep through that. It's a lot yeah. of gross. Yeah, it's, yeah, really it's not something gross. you can just sleep through. I will say that the best part of that movie, or the best parts of that movie, are the way that it reinvents like the mythos of like werewolves. Mm -hmm. And like I wrote about this, but like werewolves in particular have not received the same love that other classic monsters have received in recent years. So like everyone already gasses up vampires, and that's fair because you know, vampires are great. I have nothing against vampires. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like uh, an art house, quote unquote feature like werewolves haven't been treated as seriously and what what uh the, it's a british filmmaker his name is sean ellis what yeah. he does with werewolves is genuinely nothing that i've seen before and there's one particular scene and i keep tweeting about it but i'm not gonna spoil it there's one particular scene and you you know it's in it's yeah like, i think yeah, I okay. the one you're talking yeah we know about. we're talking i don't have to describe it because you already know it's genuinely the most like fucked up shit i've seen in like a genre piece in a long time and like every it's like one of those things where everything just works like boyd holbrook he's like 100 percent in the moment the, the 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 effects look incredible and i've seen a bunch of people look at first i would not give this it's a very kind compliment they call it uh they it reminds them of john Car carpenter yeah, and the they, were, they were saying that, that in the there was a lot of yeah. people who were gassing the movie up and they're like john carpenter would be proud and stuff the movie has its fair share of issues, in my opinion, and there are issues yeah. that I think that might make or break the film because you just can't ignore them. Yeah. But in terms of going back to like John Carpenter, that scene, I'd be like, I was thinking about it, I was like, man, like, would I say that? Because I don't like to just say that kind of shit lightly because then you say something like that and then people's expectations fly. They go incredibly high. And then when they watch the movie, if it doesn't reach that, then they get really disappointed, but it's not the movie's fault. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so but that one scene i would be like okay you can call it i don't know if it's carpenter-esque is that what you want to get because of the physical effect and what's going on i would grant it that and i say that's a fair in that one scene and just for that like honestly i sound like i'm i'm like i'm bragging about it, but this, that one scene is worth to watch the entire movie hmm. in my opinion because again i have not seen something that is so visually striking and shocking that's not like overtly offensive yeah. in a horror movie in a long time that's like that but again i think the, the the issues that people might have with it and it's not like really spoiling because you know it's a werewolf movie so like what do you like you know you talk about you hear vampires right here you think castles you think there's certain iconography there's certain things that are attached to just like the characters but in terms of werewolves i think the one thing that might turn people off is that um for everything that it does so like new and in in a inventive that you're like oh my god i've never seen this before it always stems back to like the, the cliche that it's like a like a gypsy curse yeah you know? yeah and it's not um i mean it's not like groundbreaking or it's not like even like the worst thing ever but i think it kind of holds the movie back because for again like it's making so many bold steps in all these other fields but in that one area it just decided like oh no it's just like you know like it's just typical you know gypsies got mad and like you know they yeah. they hex your family you know and then like you know gypsies like even like the, the like the term gypsy is like not something that is i would say like politically correct to say anymore yeah but like the film obviously uses that um that language because you know it's a period piece and so it is kind of like it's kind of disappointing in that regard you know yeah, that it's kind of like a stereotype that's yeah that we're kind of stuck there. we're kind of stuck in yeah. that and that like you know for, magic like, yeah. and stuff like that yeah and then you know, see like it is, you know, it is kind of disappointing because especially now, like, there's a whole conversation on the rise of on on Roma people yeah. and like the type of representation that they need in popular media. So I think this kind of it's not gonna do that any favors. But for everything else, but for everything yeah. else, it's so good. Like, you know, it's like a, it's a double edged sword. But I still think the movie's great. People, I saw people again. People are hyping it up. It's not the witch. It's not right. the witch. <laughs> but it's in that vein. And I think that's going to be enough for, for a lot of people, but it's also good to a certain extent, you know? Again, that oh. scene, just watch it for that scene, man. That <laughs> okay, so your two movies that you, those are the two you'd recommend. Uh, I 
I already forgot the names of both of them, but I know which one you're talking about. No, yeah. Nate for Silver. Yeah. yeah. You got to watch yeah. Flea, though, man. Okay, Flea like, and Nate for Silver. Yeah, dude. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. I, I definitely have those down now because you sold the shit out of those. And yeah. 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 I, I, the I'm moment I said Carpenter, I know that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, he's he's just like a good actor. He kind of, I think, it kind of gets like the Jai Courtney syndrome a little bit from critics, but he's like good. I don't, not that Jai Courtney's even bad either. Just you know, no. they kind of get put in like stock white guy roles, but they mm-hmm. like actually have like range when they can like when they're allowed to go that way. But um, yeah, uh, Gene, what do you think is the best movie you saw at the Sundance Film Festival? Hmm. I think, I think it's kind of tied to be honest. Um, well, hey, everyone gets two then. How about that? I think yeah. that's fair. Yeah. Let me just use that. I think um, like Judas and the Black Messiah, I really enjoyed. I thought that was very timely. Um, like all the performances and that, and like the way they craft that story, kind of the realism, like the uh, the ending, because you guys saw it. Yeah. It like, I yeah. did not actually, but I, oh, I know I'm that. familiar with the story. I know this. Yeah. 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 Like that was um, so well done and like, just the way that they uh, like portray, like, I don't know. I mean, even like kind of uh, Lakeith Stanfield, who's kind of like, I guess the quote unquote, like rat character of the movie, right? Like he kind of, yeah, mm-hmm. he basically like rats them all out to the Not a spoiler. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's in the title. Yeah. It's in the title. <laughs> His name is Judas. <laughs> but yeah, just kind of the way like um, that guy's been portrayed. I wouldn't say like sympathetic because he's like not really, but like, you kind of like understand like he's like in a messed up situation as well and like that and it's just like uh really like encapsulates that era of the 70s and like just everything the struggles and all that so i think it was a film that's very needed right now but um yeah just everything about it was very like electrifying and like you know so well written so well done i don't see how anyone can watch that movie it's a great movie i saw it i just saw it last night it's powerful, but I don't think how I don't I don't know how any can watch that movie and not be like a cap after. <laughs> you know? yeah. And and yeah, to think basically. that yeah, to think that there's gonna be people who watch this movie and they still won't be a cap after. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like just the thought of that. I don't know, like it's you know, it's like, kind of sickening within itself, you know. Yeah, you know, I mean like how could you like, you know, just see anything? Like you'll be like three hours waiting in line for a vaccine at Dodger Stadium because the police don't want to do anything. <laughs> No, not be ACAB. Yeah, there's there's plenty of reasons, but I think going like talking about ACAB, that movie without a doubt, and it's it's like it's not shy, but like it it sets it clear that like this like the system has always been the enemy. Yeah, and it's not a it's not a great conversation. It is pretty black and white in the sense that no, like they are the enemy. They've always done things um, like you know the capitalist machine is not uh it's not to get political because you know but yeah in uh, the film itself is very political but yeah and I w- I would, benefits I would, no yeah. one except the rich you know and i would say like even like uh it reminded me very timely like jesse Plemons character the fbi agent where he's like kind of like such a both sides person where he's like oh yeah you know i stopped the uh clan yeah and i think uh the panthers are just like the clan and he's like saying all these false equivalencies that all these like uh kind of uh not uh kind of like bad you know people with bad intentions always say in like public mm-hmm. debates yeah yeah know? absolutely it captures uh it's very three-dimensional in the sense that talking about jesse Plemons' character like what like not spoiling much but you know he's the fbi agent that uh enlists lakeith to be a rat so even him like he's a bad person he's a he's a mm-hmm. pig like there's no like that's yeah. not a debate that's not a debate you can have but it kind of puts into light that you know, people just don't, I mean, a lot of people do scratch that. A lot of people do become pigs just because they want to become pigs, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's undeniable. But people in, in like his situation, it's like this kind of thinking is something that's bred into a whole line of like class. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So like even him, like he's he's trying to like, he's trying to do his best because he's an FBI agent. He's trying to do his best to get the job done. And what's the job? You know, get the rag, get the information. But even then it's not enough. Yeah, because he... Yeah. You know, the system is, the system isn't like, it's not that easy. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, it's always going to be, it's always going to be like the worst thing imaginable. And not even yeah. the pigs see that. So, I but, gonna, yeah, I was going to say, even has like, you know, like he's uh, pretty corrupt, but like he's 
like there are like even more corrupt people like higher exactly. than like mm -hmm. Hoover and like even like his like one or two scruples he has he's kind of like forced to like even go past that yeah you know? I, it's kind of weird to say that he's like sympathetic yeah because he is again a pig at the end of the day but the movie does that really good job of it's not like humanizing, you know. Like it's yeah. kind of weird to say because you, we are. We are I make cabs. So it's, it's kind of weird. It's it's hard to talk about it, but it it's a very three dimensional film. Being like what you said about Lakeith, mm -hmm. yeah, like he's doing all this bad stuff. Like yeah, he's right. He's a rat, but also like it's all just like a result of like how oppressive the system is to everybody. Yeah, because he has. You know what I mean, like, mm -hmm. he has like nowhere else to go. Like he exactly. Get arrested and if you were like a black man at that time, what were you gonna do? Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like so. I'm I'm interested to see what more people think when the movie comes out. I'm I'm kind of like after seeing the movie, it's very good. It's kind of it is kind of disappointing to see it get like shut out in some uh, like award categories. Like now that the yeah. Golden, I mean, the Golden Globes are stupid, but also uh, the SAG nominations were announced this morning, and like the only person that's getting love is a uh, uh, Daniel Kaluuya, mm -hmm. which is you know he, he kills it. He really does kill it. Yeah. But like it's kind of like a little. It's a little disheartening not to see Lakeith get any recognition. Mm -hmm. You know. Because he does bring that um, that scale to it, where you could see all sides of the situation. It's not like one sided. Yeah. So I don't know. It is kind of disappointing, but hopefully, like the more the more people see it, you know, they can push like the campaign for it. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. Like, cause yeah, that was disappointing. Cause I think, uh, well, I remember your tweet was like every every single announcement they had like uh, for the nominees, <laughs> it was like laughing my ass off. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean it's like it was that's like a every. Whole other yeah, yeah every, a whole other combo. every single but, like nominee was like rami malik and uh bohemian <laughs> rhapsody that's oh yeah you're not wrong and like yeah and it's, it's, there's genuinely a lot of like just raw power on display in this film not even first from the actors but from like uh shaka king like the director just from yeah. his point of view and how he's able to capture certain moments and frame certain things it's incredible so yeah it's like close to like I, I'm not gonna start like nitpicking, but it's like close to a perfect movie. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard. It's it is disheartening. And then when of course like again we could say it's timely. We of course it is. You know right. we could say that especially post 2019 and everything that happened last year. That's an important movie. But all that stuff again like in my opinion it's kind of redundant to keep saying that because these movies are they're gonna keep getting made, and mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. But we're always gonna get historical pieces. And each time a movie like that comes out, people are gonna say, "Wow, it's so timely." Like, right. like it's like they we've been saying this for like ten years straight. Like you know, you you understand that things have not changed. The fact that you can still say something that is timely for like the past twenty years or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So, I hope that the conversation, uh, takes like a new avenue in that sense. Yeah. Because yeah. I again, I don't know how you can watch this movie with a straight face and be like, yeah, you know what? Not all cops are bad, or you know, like you know, like yeah, yeah. Leave that shit outside. I don't know how you can do that. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, it's like, uh, this really, yeah, I mean, what more can you say? I mean, hope uh, things actually change, you know? But the movie does end on a note that kind of, on, on a hope of, like, being able to, like, persevere and continue even, like, when the oppressive system is still at play, mm -hmm. you know? I think that's the most important thing, probably. Yeah. But, I mean, it's it's almost a perfect Again. Yeah, yeah, I would say. So. Yeah, I would say so too. I mean, like it's like you know, like so close to like four and a half. Uh, it was like four and a half for me. So yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, I mean, again, it's just like the, all the raw power. But yeah. Um, I was gonna say the other film that's like tied for me because it's like uh, one of the films that are that is like just I love all his like movies. Um, was in the Earth from Ben Whiteley. I'm gonna fight yeah. you on that one, but you can go. You start. Yeah. You start. You start. Well, Diego liked it too, so we're gonna yeah. Like, so this is I'll, I'll hop okay. in a little bit. Let's go. Too. Let's go. It's, let's, it's let's Ben go. Wheatley, team. Ben no, Wheatley. No. No. Okay. So I saw people again. I saw the movie. I don't think the movie's bad. Okay. So yeah. off the bat, I am. Not, I do not think this is a bad movie. Okay. So don't be like Andrew. He hates it. Yeah. But I will be. I will be pretty honest in this. Um, people were like. Because the last movie he did was uh, that Rebecca remake, and I heard that oh, movie was not good. I, I still haven't seen that. I'm not gonna talk about it. I haven't seen it. We're gonna show. hop over that one. Yeah, but what was the movie he did before that? Uh, before it, it was um, Free Fire, I think, right? No, it wasn't Free Fire. It was um, was it Happy New Year? Colin Burstead. 
Oh, I didn't see that one. Yeah, he okay. did like a BBC movie. Okay. So, when you know, in the in the festival, like guys, you watch a movie and you go to Twitter right after and you tweet your opinion, like, oh, this movie is this. You give reaction. You see yeah. all these other people giving these reactions. I had to write about the movie, but I saw these people were like, Ben Wheatley is back. This is a Ben Wheatley feature. There is such a thing as a Ben Wheatley film. And my general, again, maybe it's because I'm not as perverse in this, and I'm not, or yeah. I don't really know him that well. Maybe you guys can enlighten me. I was like, where did this fool go? Like, you guys are saying that, that like, oh, he's back, but where has he been? Like, what so, do you mean? Like, where, where did he go in the first place? I don't understand. Because the movie, again, I think it's good, and there's a lot of talent on display from him. I think as a filmmaker, what he manages to, like, like convey, I think he's very talented, but I just don't think like all the pieces necessarily came together in the right way for me to be like thoroughly engaged from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, it's another COVID movie. More for the right. For last, well, another COVID movie. Mm -hmm. but, I would say it's it's COVID, but it's not really COVID. No, no, but he's saying like it was made during COVID. Oh, that's, okay. Yeah, yeah, like it was but, it was literally that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it yeah, that's not, I'm not, the movie's not about COVID. I will give it this like as much as I, I again I'm probably we're gonna get into it a little bit deeper, but for a movie that is inspired by COVID or filmed during COVID or what right. you want to call it. I've been, I've been saying, I've been calling it a post pandemic, no pandemic inspired because yeah. I can't, we can't really say post pandemic because we're still in the middle yeah, of the pandemic. Still in it. So it's I just call it pandemic expired, inspired for a film that, and there's another one we're going to talk about later, but uh, it's probably, we've gotten like what we got that Michael Bay movie that was Longbird. Shit. No one's like, watching that. Of, of, I haven't seen it. it. That was like, a, well, he produced it and he didn't direct it. Yeah. But it was like offensive, hollow stuff, right? Then yeah. we also got that movie that went to HBO Max that... Um, oh, yeah, with Anne Hathaway. It's called like Locked Up. It's called Locked Lock, Down. Yeah. Locked Down. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, it, two words, Locked Down. And again, like it was cute from what, what I, I didn't see it, but from what my friends saw it, like they said it was cute enough. It was like, you know, the it's like a heist movie during lockdown. Like, yeah, you yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess, you know, but... Out of all the movies that we've gotten that have been inspired by what's going on, this is probably the most nuanced and mm -hmm. subtle of all of them. Yeah. Because obviously, like you're watching the movie and there, there is like a virus at play and you mm -hmm. see people are like, they're using hand sanitizer, they're, uh, they're spraying themselves and they're going through all this stuff. But nev never once did I think about COVID during watching yeah. the movie, which is a good thing. Because all this other time, you're trying to watch all these movies, like even the lockdown movie, it's a romantic comedy, right? <laughs> you're trying to take your mind away from the real world, but you're just always thinking about COVID because the movie is always talking about, like, it's always being obnoxious with, like, these things. Yeah, and but it's this like movie they, didn't do that. Yeah, well, I mean, for the other films, like, well, like the Michael Bay movie, like, they think they're really clever. It's like COVID-23. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, Don, I'm just cringing. I'm cringing at you, Michael Bay. Yeah, yeah. F fuck, fuck that. I, I will say yeah. that, um, so for Ben Wheatley stuff, his stuff is always, it, it looks like very austere. Like, mm -hmm. I think he has a reputation for being like very, like, uh, one note dramatic, but like his stuff is like really funny sometimes. And yeah. I think this in the earth gets really funny, like, yeah, in, in a really fucked up dark way. But like, mm -hmm. I, I think. It's, really it's, it's not it's not a perfect i wouldn't say it's his best film i saw some people calling it that and i'm like i i don't i don't know about that I like, it more, I like it more than free fire i like free fire a lot um i like it about as much as like high rise and kill list so if you've seen those this is like of the same vein yeah or like a field in england very field mm -hmm. in englandy um <laughs> what, English what movie yeah he's a very fucking british filmmaker <laughs> but yeah. like i i think what makes it like work for me is that like it's not so much uh, like just like a horror film set during like a pandemic. Like that's kind of the setup. Yeah. And it's ultimately yeah. about a bunch of crackers in the woods using <laughs> people of color as like almost like experiments. Yeah. And then they're like trying to figure out like the key to like existence, like the, the melding of myth and science and facts and like, right. how do these things all coalesce? And then, you know, we have, um, I, I have an Indian and a black lead and they're just like suffering and trying to survive and that's kind of like i think a really brilliant decision i wouldn't say mm -hmm. the whole film is like oh this uh, this is a fantastic experience right. i thought it was really good even great but that's what really like stuck with me that like oh he's calling out like the bullshit of these people being like oh we can figure out through the suffering of people like how to like go on 
and mm-hmm. like let's find real answers and it's like no stop contributing to people's suffering because there's right. enough wrong shit in the world because the yeah, pandemic exactly. in the beginning doesn't even matter that's right. spoiler alert like 10 minutes in the film that's it this is the premise that's why people wear masks because reality and we need an excuse that's literally it mm-hmm. and then he weaves that narrative into the film as it starts getting darker and darker and weirder there's like some Stan Brackage style montage stuff thrown at you. So if you're like, yeah, if you're yeah. very light sensitive, maybe you don't watch this one. It, so it's there was a, a seizure warning. Intense. There was a seizure yeah, warning was. before the film. And oh, I, I, was didn't like, even, I, didn't I was like, I was like, okay, but holy shit. Like, yeah. I think, no, generally, if you guys are uh, epileptic, be very careful. Yeah. Because this movie gets very, uh, there's a lot of like flashes, like for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so just a heads up. It's a very uh, good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, what you're saying about the uh, two leads being people of color reminded me of like Night of the Living Dead, where uh, you know, what was it like uh, Romero kept saying it's not, it wasn't like a deliberate choice, but it really was, mm-hmm. you know, because um, yeah, you know, it just it reminds me of just kind of uh, I guess like kind of the situation where you know you see like uh fucking people dining out still, and uh, you know, like it's all like white people. <laughs> Yeah, you know, going I mean, I, I think that casting is very intentional mm-hmm. for that, you know, and yeah. um, he, it feels like he had, he had this like angry film inside of him mm-hmm. over the, I don't know what his experience was on the, his last couple movies, but this feels like something a filmmaker's like, you want your fucking movie? Here's your fucking movie. Right. But <laughs> yeah. it's not, it's not like cynical either though. I don't think, no, I think I it's just a little think. harsh and, yeah. and some of the, some of the gore, it's not like outlandish. It's just like, I, I got tense. I don't get tense a lot with violent stuff anymore because, you know, at a certain point when you watch like as many movies as us, it's like, I've been there, done that, right? Yeah. Then you're bringing up Eight for Silver and you said that was pretty like gnarly. Yeah. That When you brought that up, that reminded me of scenes um, of this and I was like, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, was, that was a little harsh. Yeah, that foot scene, I, I couldn't like, oh. Uh, da, 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 don't, yeah. don't, say, don't, yeah. don't say any, <laughs> any other stuff because there, there's a handful where I'm just like, fuck, like they, these people get fucked up. Like, yeah. E- I, every member of the cast um but it's i i was very impressed i i did not think i was gonna like it as much as i did i was just like oh cool ben wheatley i like him and and now it's one of my favorites of his uh, uh andrew i would if you didn't like this that much i probably wouldn't recommend the rest of his filmography but if you did and you're like curious like check out kill list which is a mm-hmm. super slow burn um it doesn't get as crazy as this but it gets yeah. very it gets more disturbing in a way so that, that'd be my recommendation at yeah. least yeah there's something i want to touch upon is like that's how it's kind of it's kind of dangerous how we say with eight for, eight for silver how like you talk about all these festival films like we're some of the first people there's a lot of people who still have not seen this so they're going off of what we're saying so when someone tweets eight for silver is like the witch but we put a werewolf in it that's gonna get people like what but then it's not what the movie is because the movie's yeah. not even, the movie's not even trying to do that and that's unfair to the film right so yeah i saw a lot of going into uh, in the earth a lot of people and i think this is very fair because the score is absolutely amazing as yeah. much as like, mm-hmm. a lot of the movie didn't work but when it goes into like heavy sim like duh, like holy shit i loved it that was great um but i saw a lot of people oh my god i'm, I'm just getting upset thinking about it one person, I don't even know who this person is, so it's, there's no beef. I don't even know right. who you are. I just, I was scrolling, said, this is Annihilation, pause, that's fair, because it's about nature, mm-hmm. there's a heavy synth, and there's some psychedelic shit going on. So I'll give you that one, that's fair, even though these are two different movies, right? Someone said, this is like Annihilation meets Midsummer. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the fuck that means. <laughs> First of all, I don't know what that's not this movie, in my opinion. Um, yeah, but, I, I don't, I don't see that at all. When, yeah, that's, when that's, someone, uh, yeah. you know, you're putting things into boxes. You know, they would just want to put like a review into a box and like, right? It's, it's it. good. It's good for that SEO click. And yeah. Yeah. I think at a certain point, film journalists, while they need to be more wary of it, like at a certain point, our brains are just like they start putting themselves in the boxes too like okay we have yeah, to hit exactly. this note this yeah. note this note right it's, it becomes like a subconscious thing and that sucks yeah. seo clicks are, are the worst Al- like algorithms are going to fuck up art more than like any individual you know yeah. but um but sorry i just i agree no. that. that's a that's, horrible no, thing that's true but when you say something like that oh, that sentence well that sentence is pretty crazy that's a pretty crazy thing to say but and i'm gonna bring this up when we talk about prisoners because it's funny it's a, it's a funny comparison but 
people are going to get their expectations incredibly fucking high or they're going to think wow this must be the next big thing the next big thing but when they watch it and I, it's not even you they're going to not like it because they're going to think it's like some kind of pandemic cross midsummer annihilation stuff yeah. that's not what the movie is and it's doing something completely different it's another slow burn it has different ideas in its mind and people are going to judge it for something else that they saw on, online yeah right so I think this movie is going to suffer through a little bit of that. And it's not the movie's fault. Like, honestly, like, it didn't work for me all the way. I did like a lot of it. But that's not something I can pin the movie down for. Because they're going to be saying all this, like, stuff for, like, this. Like, I wrote about it when I was writing my review. But it's going to fall into, like, I don't want it to because I don't want this to happen to anyone. But it's going to fall into the trap when people talk about elevated horror. <laughs> and that term yeah, itself, yeah. even though it, it comes with good intention because you want to you want to talk about something that you genuinely love and you want to you want to praise it but it's like again like it's 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 a box because when you put it in that box you're not going to let the movie be criticized or not not even critic criticism but there's other discussions to be had mm -hmm. like the the conversation about the people of color that's some that's not something i had thought about yet yeah. right so mm -hmm. i'm genuinely thinking about it now but when you put it into that box there's discussions like that that don't fit in the box and then there's other criticisms that just exist outside of the box. Yeah. So it like, doesn't work, you know? Yeah. I was going to say, oh, no, I was just going to say, didn't like the, uh, the two like scientist characters remind you of like people at Starbucks? I, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> the ones that you searched. That's a, they, that's a they, funny they... comparison, but. But. Yeah, I, I don't know if I see that, but I definitely oh, no, see like like oh, DNA. No, no, I'm, I'm just like... talking to no, I'm talking to Andrew because yeah, oh. no, oh. that's funny. That's funny. That's generally funny. A little bit, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's funny. But you see, something like that, that comment doesn't exist in elevated horror. Oh, you can't say that. Yeah. Or that, that's a dumb comment. Why would you say that? The movie that's elevated. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it has a good score. It has like a it has all these things going for it. But I think if you go into it open-minded not having the, the preconceived notion that it's a pandemic or because there's very different things that can come with that you'll you'll enjoy it more instead of going with all these ideas in your head because yeah. this movie is very particular mm -hmm. very particular yeah and, yeah. yeah i mean it's like it's a you know like i said it's like a covid movie it's about it's not about covid it's like just kind of the sentiment and like just kind of like um this ideology that gets uh Mm -hmm. you know that we're like kind of like stuck you know fighting with like people still want to fucking like go out and like like live their life like everything's yeah. normal and it's not you know they want to like you know like not wear a mask and like you know it's not going to be all the privileged people that are going to get sick and die it's going to be like you know all the uh you know like communities that are in like you know lower income neighborhoods that are like primarily uh, people of color like it's going to be them that are most affected you know and i felt like yeah. that would be really encapsulated about yeah yeah i mean like you know 10 months in you know you know see people still don't take it seriously <laughs> yeah you know fucking so ridiculous. i mean you really captured that attitude you know the frustration that i feel yeah, yeah I, I think that's what i'm gonna walk away with from that film the most too like it yeah. it got like the the feeling of all this bullshit mm -hmm. more so than like just like it's not a miserable experience you no, know? like not, i don't yeah. i don't you don't know like it's it's good to have films that are timely like we've been talking about and are important quote unquote right but like sometimes you just want to watch something that's like a pure expression it doesn't need to make you like be like wow life sucks like yeah sometimes it does that's not yeah. what i need to be reminded of and just a, a quick shout out to uh another film also i saw uh before we get into prison of the ghost land a uh, wild indian which um, I wasn't head over heels in love with, but I, I really would recommend and I really liked it. It was made by Native American filmmakers and uh, a primarily indigenous people's crew. And a uh, shout out to other film critic, uh, Shia Vassar, who was blasting about it on Twitter. And I wouldn't have even known that film existed if not for her. So thank you. Uh, also linked down below there. But Prisoners of the Ghost Land, Cageheads, you know what's up or you think you do. Um, I am also a big fan of the director Sion Sono, who made such classics as Anti Porno. Uh, uh, oh, what else did he? Oh, everyone's favorite, Love Exposure, the four hour feature film that everyone swears to God does not feel like four hours. And mm. they're right, it does not. <laughs> I don't know what that, what, what's up with that. Um, but he's like a genuinely crazy person filmmaker. Yeah. He's a very individual voice. So naturally, 
him making a film with Nicolas Cage that's a blending of East meets West film genres that's and perfect. tropes. It, it, yeah, it's perfect. And the film is not. It's I, I was slightly let down by yeah. it, but it is absolutely worth checking out. And I would say that's probably my favorite film of the festival anyway. So like, once I got into like, okay, this is not going to be a crazy like action movie expression. Like I, like uh, that, that might be my own uh, precognition of the event. Right. But it's, it's a very specific sort of like exploitation film about how hard it is for an American action star to not engage with violence. That's kind of what it becomes about. And there's a lot of visuals like representing like, the nuclear bombs being dropped on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Like it feels like a film that's that uh, wants to engage with like the meme era of Nicolas Cage, but also <laughs> understands that there's something deeply wrong with American cinema. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also calling us out because th this isn't like a huge spoiler. It's just like a, a set piece is very specifically designed to be like time is standing still here. We have to keep it from going forward because it's comforting to sit in one space for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that was, that's when I was like, okay, I'm back in the movie. I, I think I get what this is all going for. Um, I really liked it. Uh, I, I, I cannot wait to see it again. Uh, but Andrew, what did you think of Prisoners of the Ghostland? And is it your first Sion Sono film? That's a good point because it is. And I think this is going to be a lot of people's first Sion Sono movie. And there's nothing wrong with that because, you know what, now that I've seen this, I'm, I mean, I, I've i heard a lot of people talk about Anti Porno, specifically mm -hmm. that one. I don't yeah. know a lot, but, you know, that's a good thing that I'm interested enough to go check that out on my own time. So I think that's great, like, that a lot of people are going to be introduced to this, I mean, to him. But, again, like, I'm on the same boat where I was slightly disappointed, but... I say emphasis on slightly because like everything else is just like firing on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. It's like incredible. I was not just from like, I didn't expect the movie to go into like, uh, again, like th this is what I was going to bring up again, how like you may, you say shit like, Oh, this is annihilation meets midsummer. And you're like, that doesn't make any fucking sense. But you say this and like, Oh yeah, this is a samurai Western that has hints of Mad Max and army of darkness. That sentence does not make sense. But that is exactly what this movie is. And it's like that rare occasion where, the, that rare occasion where like the chaos, there's like an actual like sanity to it. But the one thing that I've been talking like about the most is just like the sheer level of like craftsmanship is just like phenomenal. Like you yeah. can't deny it. Like even if like some, some elements of like the plot or whatever maybe didn't work for you, this genuinely, in my opinion, felt like I was like brought, dropped into the world of like Final Fantasy. <laughs> because like those those games particularly they they blend i just, I just started games. playing seven yeah nice. they yeah they they blend like western visuals with eastern visuals and they make one thing so you'll have like uh people with samurai blades or swords and and quiches in one corner yeah. then you cross the street and then there's cowboys that have like giant chickens you know i, that, I that wish kind of... i saw it damn it. <laughs> it it feels like that you'll and... you'll you'll like it gene it's... yeah Andrew and I, I think, are just working out conflicting feelings because it's like it, you do kind of need to readjust your expectations. Don't go in expecting another Mandy. This isn't Mandy. I love no, Mandy. No, uh, uh, this isn't this isn't Drive Angry. I, I like Drive Angry for oh. the record. Um, <laughs> hot take, I guess. I don't know what people think about that one. But um, yeah. it's it's like an action movie that it, it. You know what? If if there's any point of comparison, it might be like the first John Wick, where it's like he doesn't he's not interested in the violence at first, but imagine that stretched out for like an hour. And then the last half hour is like, that's when it starts getting physically nuts. And like the, yeah. the action and the editing and the cuts in the scenes, that's when they start getting more zany, but it's really not about that. It's, it, it is far more character focused, like yeah. on, a, on an American cinema level than I expected from Sion Sono. Cause his, yeah. his stuff is very like insular and very goofy all the time and this one is is surprisingly grounded and then mm -hmm. everyone else who watches it and this is like their first movie for him they're gonna be like what the fuck are you talking about this yeah. is fucking nuts just then prepare to watch the rest of his movies and you'll be like oh that's why you were you were kind of put off at first from this one yeah <laughs> yeah something about when talking about the cage heads it's like nicholas cage in general where people think and this happens this happened a lot with mandy and to be fair 
there's a big appeal to us wanting to see Nicolas Cage do this crazy shit. Because like a big part of the the, the thing that sold me on this movie, I didn't even know about the Eastern and the Western themes and stuff. But a big thing that sold me was that like, oh yeah, Nicolas Cage, he's like a he's like an assassin or he's like a like a really like a badass. And he has a bunch of like bombs attached to his body, like the suicide squad, and he has to go on a mission. I was like, all right, that's enough for me. You know what I mean? Like I don't even know more. Don't tell me more. I want to see it. But <laughs> yeah. there's this big like misconception that people like Mandy, people like movies like uh, Color Out Color Out of Space is another one that he did recently because they're just so crazy. Like, wow, they're so crazy shit. Like, and that that's true to a point because again, like Mandy, there it is a movie that has a, a chainsaw duel in it. There it is yeah. a movie that has Nicolas Cage make like this fucking medieval metal like axe in it. You know what I mean? But at mm. the if you actually watch those movies and you actually like give them the attention, they're not like just about that. You know, Mandy's a very thematically deep film that's about like trauma, that's about like abuse and stuff like that. It, it's more than just a revenge film. And this one is the same case where there's crazy shit going on in this movie. And I feel like you can't talk about it without saying that like, yeah, Nicolas Cage has like bombs attached, but he has, he has a bomb attached to each nut. He has a bomb attached to each of one of his balls. When you say that to someone, they're like, oh, you're just going to watch it because it's crazy, right? Because <laughs> like, and I mean, yeah, to a point, but what Diego said, this movie has a lot more on its mind. Yeah. You know, uh, a big thing that I got from it was like, was a uh, vul- vulnerability, you know what I mean? Like the state of going back, like breaking the badass shell that you like, you may or may not have, like breaking the stoicism, you know, that's not, and again, like Diego said, like it, 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 get, it does get crazy. Like there's crazy stuff that happens in it, you know, with the whole plot and whatever, but that's not the reason why, in my opinion, people go see Nicolas Cage movie. You know? He's entertaining. He does crazy stuff. Yeah. But people forget that this dude like won an Oscar. Like that this, this dude is actually like a really like he's a esteemed actor who's made like incredible films before. I can't speak for uh, of him as a person because I don't know him like that, but as an artist, <laughs> I yeah. don't, you know, but as an artist, like yeah. you can't deny that this dude has made some like incredible films. Like I can't even talk like without that like adaptation, like Wild at Heart. Yeah, they're him. He's crazy. Like you know, he's going loony, but uh, leaving Las Vegas. But this dude, like he actually does care about what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, he puts a lot of himself in these. He movies. does, and I think a lot of people fail to recognize that. So when they when they hear Prisoners of the Ghostland, they they see that they hear what I said. It's Mad Max army of darkness and all this stuff like they they it is it, it is like no joke but at the same time like there's more stuff to that like there's more stuff underneath and mm-hmm. that's what makes these movies work all the time and i think yeah. to the benefit that's why this movie is going to be kind of polarizing maybe because people are going to want it to be this big fucking crazy uh, two-hour thing but it actually has it's actually like more like personal which is kind of it works but one thing that I don't think Diego's touched upon is that as much as like we like this movie and like, oh my God, like it looks beautiful. I you genuinely like I people throw this sentence a lot very lightly, but I've genuinely never seen anything like this in terms of scale, like the budget that it had to be able to pull all the shit off. I've never seen anything like that. Um, but it kind of feels like too much of a movie just to be, I think it's only an hour and 40 minutes. And it feels like so much movie packed into that time because you watch this movie and there's a bunch of like uh, eye op- like eye opening things that like set pieces, characters that you want to know more about. You're like, oh, what the fuck is that? Like, what is this? Yeah. And the film tries to give you like all the mythos, but it kind of doesn't feel like enough for just an hour and 40 minutes, at least in my opinion. And again, like I love this movie as much for what it was doing. So I would have been OK if this movie was like 20 minutes, maybe run it out to a full two hours instead of 140 like i would not have minded holy shit like i would i could have stayed in this movie as long as it wanted me to but it feels genuinely like when you look back at it there's certain ideas that either get kind of like glossed over because we've already said a lot we've said all these inspirations yeah. uh, the east and the west and then diego brought up like uh the themes of like hiroshima and nagasaki this movie's heavy like <laughs> there's yeah. a lot going on really and I felt, like, I felt like there were certain things that when i was look- watching it and it kind of does have that grindhouse appeal. Like it, it reminded me of Planet Terror in certain uh, situations. Mm-hmm. Like you know how like at the end of Planet Terror, Bruce Willis is like such a badass, and then when you finally meet him, he just kind of just grows big, and they shoot him, and that's it. But it's funny, like you know that's 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 a part of the appeal. There's a bunch of stuff 
like that in this film and it's and it has that same appeal but looking back on it i was like but why not because it was crazy but like what does that mean because the movie's aiming for a lot of like heavy themes but like i don't know if it reached all of that and it's funny because like um I watched the Q&A after it. I don't know. If you, did you watch the Q&A, Diego? Yeah, I did. It was, it was good. And the writer, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he talked about like how they had to cut a lot of the movie already. And like yeah. I think just from watching the, the film, it's kind of obvious because there's a lot of stuff. But he talked that they had to cut like a like a, like a a bull monster or some shit. Or like there was like a – like there, <laughs> I was like – it might be it's like, where are you going to even fit that? You know, because there's already a lot, you know? So – I genuinely think that it's maybe like too much for maybe its own good. Yeah. Um, but yeah. it's still enough to like it's still enough to absolutely make me recommend it. Okay. Yeah. I, well, it's, I'm definitely it's something it it's something that I I I completely agree with that criticism too. Like it is too much considering some other films that we we don't unfortunately have time to talk about uh maybe we will another time when you come back of course because yeah. we're going to drag you on eventually. Um <laughs> like I'd rather have too much than too little, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, so I, I definitely appreciate that. But for now, yeah. Andrew Salazar, thank you so much for joining us again. Where can the people find you and your writings? You can follow me on social media, uh, Andrew J six to six on Twitter. Uh, I'm going to continue talking about a lot of these movies because a lot of them do deserve to get um, carried into like the the, the, the months that are going to come. Uh, the discussions are far from over. That's for sure for a lot of these movies, especially when more people get to see them. So you can follow me on my Twitter, AndrewJ626. And of course, Discussing Film is always going to be Discussing Film on Twitter. And uh, we're gonna, I'm going to keep sharing a lot of our, um, our Sundance coverage in particular. So if that's something that you're interested in, we did cover all these movies that we talked about, but we also did other ones as well. Nice. Well, thank you. And Gene, where can the people find you? Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, Gene9892. And uh, yeah, um, I was just going to say, um, I want to throw in praise for A Glitch in the Matrix, which we didn't get to talk to, but... I really enjoyed that documentary. It was a really weird uh, documentary on sim- stimulation theory. And uh, yeah, I thought that one was pretty neat. Yeah, I'll, I'll check that one out too because I heard that one was really, really funky. Uh, yeah. And of course, you can follow me at the Diego Crespo on Twitter. Check out the Waffle Press on Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Patreon, and Instagram. Uh, and stay tuned for the return of the Avatar retrospectives. We're going to start Legend of Korra very soon. Um, had some technical difficulties uh, earlier this year, but we're, we're going to come back strong. And uh, March, stay tuned for March Madness. We're doing March Monster Madness leading up to Godzilla versus Kong. So stay tuned. We have, we have a couple of stuff planned out for that. We're very excited. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Stay inside. We have been professionally unprofessional. professional. <laughs>